Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's orientation webinar for the recipients of the Fiscal Year 2019 Second Chance Act Innovative Reentry Initiatives Building System Capacities and Testing Strategies to Reduce Recidivism Grant Award. My name is Olivia Kukui, and I am a policy analyst at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Before we begin, I have a couple of technical notes. If you encounter connections or audio problems during this webinar, please call WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-3239. We'll also post that number in the chat box on your screen. Unfortunately, there are some connection issues we may not be able to resolve during the webinar. However, we are recording today's webinar and it will be posted on our website along with a copy of the slides used in today's presentation at csgjusticecenter.org slash nrrc. At the end of today's webinar, we will have time for questions from the audience. To ask a question, please enter in the Q&A panel at the bottom right hand corner of your screen. You can ask questions at any point during the webinar. We will do our best to answer as many as possible before we end today. Joining me for today's webinar are Dr. Rachel Brochette, Senior Policy Advisor at the Bureau of Justice Assistance, U.S. Depar Department of Justice, Jennifer Lewis, State Policy Advisor, also at the Bureau of Justice Assistance, U.S. Department of Justice, Robert Viak, Program Manager at the Office of Reentry, Louisiana Department of Public Safety and Corrections, and again, myself, Olivia Kakui, Policy Analyst for the Corrections and Reentry Division at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Before we get started, I want to give a quick overview of the Justice Center. The Justice Center is a national nonprofit organization that serves policymakers at the local, state, and federal levels from all branches of government. Staff provides practical nonpartisan advice and evidence-based, conscious-driven strategies to increase public safety and strengthen communities. You can find our website at csgjusticecenter.org, and you can also follow us on Twitter at csgjc. We are consistently adding new content and resources on our website, and we send out a monthly newsletter that provides information on about the latest research, funding, funding opportunities, distance learning events, and other news about reentry. We encourage everyone who hasn't done so already to sign up for the newsletter by going to csgjusticecenter.org slash subscribe. The newsletter highlights reentry work being done around the nation, provides information on new publications and resources, as well as updates subscribers on training, relevant news, and most appropriate for this webinar, the latest reentry funding opportunities. During today's presentation, we'll begin with Dr. Brochette and Ms. Lewis, who will provide an overview of the Second Chance Act Innovative Reentry Initiative Grants and Technical Assistance to Include Reporting Requirements. I will then discuss the planning and implementation process of the grant. Then Robert V. Hock from the Office of Reentry, Louisiana Department of Public Safety and Corrections will speak on his experience as a grantee recipient. Finally, we will conclude the webinar with time for questions and answers. With that, I will turn it over to Rachel to get started. Rachel? Thanks so much, Olivia, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, first of all, just a quick congratulations on your IRI award. We're so excited to welcome you all into the BJA family. As Olivia said, my name is Rachel Brusha, and I'm a senior policy advisor at BJA, overseeing the policy side of the IRI program. You'll be hearing from my uh, counterpart in programs, Jennifer Lewis, a little later in this presentation as well. So as an overview of who B, uh, BJA is, also known as the Bureau of Justice Assistance, we're an agency within the Office of Justice Programs in DOJ that sits in the intersection of policy and practice. So our mission is to provide leadership and services in grant administration and criminal justice policy development so that we can support state, local, and tribal communities. We try and keep our finger on the pulse of the field and provide funding to jurisdictions to address those key challenges and test new strategies to help advance the field of criminal justice. 
One of the types of funding we push out through grants comes through the Second Chance Act. It was originally signed into law in 2008 by then President Bush and was reauthorized in 2018 as a subcomponent of the First Step Act. To date, the Second Chance Act has supported over $400 million in reentry investments to a variety of initiatives across the country through several grant programs, including this one. A unique feature authorized in the legislation is the creation of the National Reentry Resource Center, also known as the NRRC. So the NRRC provides technical assistance and other resources to Second Chance Act grantees, including you as new IRI awardees. So in short, their role is to help you be successful at accomplishing your project goals. They deliver training and technical assistance as well as serve as a resource center on reentry writ large. They're a wonderful partner to have and a helpful resource for others in your community to tap. The NRSC will be transitioning providers in the coming months, so it will be moving from the CSG Justice Center to the American Institute of Research, also known as AIR. Um, the function of the NRSC will remain the same. You will receive all of the same TA and resources as um, all previous grantees have received, and we're hoping to make that transition as seamless as possible. But we want to make you aware as grantees that that transition is coming, so if you are going to hear from some new point of contact sometime in the coming months, um, but your BJA contacts will remain the same. So now, just to get a quick sense of who you all are as organizations and your past experiences with BJA, you'll be seeing a poll pop up on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, we would like to know if you have previously received a BJA award, and if you have, was it an, S an SCA or Second Chance Act award? So we'll give you just a moment to answer that question, or those, both those questions. We're tallying up the results. Just hold on one second. Oh, wonderful. And thanks so much all for participating and for your responses. So it looks like the majority of you all have received a BJA award, which is great news for us. And many of you have also received a previous Second Chance Act award. So we're happy to have you all back in the fold and hopefully this will make the process of getting your award kicked off and along the way a little bit easier. So as a new IRI grantee, in this case, many of you are second time IRI grantees or third time, um, you are joining a large group of agencies and organizations throughout the country and Guam who have been dedicated to improving the pre and post release services in their communities. So through this fiscal year, there have been over 171 awards made and over $70 million in funding. This year, we were fortunate we had a very large and very strong crop of applications in the IRI grant program, and we ended up making a total of 14 awards, which is one of the larger cohorts we've had in a while. So we have projects across the United States being conducted by state, local, and tribal agencies, which is wonderful, and we're looking forward to hearing more from all of you as your projects develop. You can see the first seven agencies listed here. and our next seven listed on this, on this slide. So all the projects you're planning are unique and different, and that's wonderful. So we hope in the coming months and years that we'll have a lot of opportunities for peer learning so you can get to know each other better, pick each other's brains about what's working and what's not working, um, so we can further increase the network of folks who are in the cutting edge of reentry work. 
Just as a quick recap, I'm sure you all remember this very well from when you were submitting your applications, but just generally about what the goals of the IRI program are. Um, we're providing, again, state, local jurisdictions and tribes with the resources and TTA necessary to identify the assets and gaps in their reentry systems and to develop capacity and partnerships to provide services that prevent recidivism, reduce crime, and improve public safety. This is part of the larger innovation suite uh, as you may have heard of, where we're developing and investing in programs that use that practitioner research partnership model to use data, evidence, and innovation so we can have strategies that are effective and economical. Overall in IRI, we are working on the implementation of comprehensive and collaborative reentry strategies that deal with offenders who are medium to high risk for recidivating, and that's a high priority of the Attorney General. As you might recall from the solicitation, your award is laid out in three distinct phases. The first is the planning phase, then the implementation phase, then evaluation. So once your budgets have cleared, during the planning phase, you'll have access to $75,000 of your budget for planning purposes. The primary task here is going to be to work with your TA provider to complete an action plan, often known as the planning and implementation guide. This plan will help you assess your reentry system, refine your proposal with a detailed work plan to make general system improvements and stand up a demonstration project. Once you submit that to BJA for approval, the remaining portion of your award will be released and you move into the implementation phase, which is really where the rubber hits the road. This is where you'll be putting your detailed plan into action. And the last year of your award is reserved for evaluation. So funds should only be used to support that rather than continuing on with project activities. Your final evaluation report will be due at grant closeout. Again, just as a reminder, the two key buckets we're looking for here for building capacity are general system improvements and building capacity through a pilot project. Again, we like to think of this as general system improvements are improvements that will benefit all people in reentry, whereas your pilot or demonstration project is specifically designed to impact a population within that general reentry population. You'll be hearing in greater detail from a past IRR or current IRI grantee about their experience and what were their keys to grant success. But this slide here shows a little bit of a cheat sheet of the things that we want you to consider as you're moving forward. In order for your IRI grant to be successful, what we've seen over the years is that ongoing engagement with your reentry task force, partnership with all the other key agencies in your area, collaboration with a research partner, connection with community providers, and active participation with training and technical assistance are really some of the key areas that we see that are likely to increase your success as an IRI grantee. And last, a second quick sheet, uh, cheat sheet from me. Uh, two things to, to point out, and then I will transition to Jennifer. First is that you're going to have to provide PMC data. It is the bane of many a project, but every quarter you'll need to report on your activities in the uh, performance measurement management tool, excuse me. Um, we are planning on scheduling a webinar with the PMT team soon, so we hope that you will also uh, be able to join us for that. It's a very helpful refresher for those of you who've had awards in the past or very useful information for those of you who have not had to do PMT before. Um, we hope to have updated contact information for the NRRC soon, but until then, please, we ask points of contact on your projects to keep out email communications from BJA, CSG, and from AIR um, as we manage this transition. And most importantly, as I'll be transitioning to Jennifer next, she is going to be your best contact at BJA for anything related to financial and progress reports and if you need to submit again. So I'm going to kick it to her now um, to talk a bit more about post-award grant management. Thanks, Rachel. Hello, everyone. Again, I'm Jennifer Lewis, the BJA Programs Office State Policy Advisor for IRI. I'm pretty much your go-to person for all things grant management related. I want to quickly discuss important items to remember now that you receive your award. Please take note of the special conditions that are included in your award notification package. Special conditions are included on all DOJ awards so please read through each one carefully as each condition may include specific requirements. Most importantly, 
you will need to pay attention to any withholding special conditions that may be placed on your award. These withholding conditions place holds on funds for overdue reports, pending budget approvals, or other programmatic requirements, including missing documents that were not included as part of the application. The IRI grant includes a withholding for the development of the planning and implementation guide or action plan. So please make sure to work closely with the TTA provider to complete the guide. Submission of the final guide will need to be submitted to BJA for final approval and the release of this withholding to access implementation funds. You should notice that there is a withholding for conditional clearance for budget approval. At this time, there is a delay with our financial office for budget reviews, but they're in the process of reviewing the budgets now. Um, so you'll be notified via GMS if your budget is approved or I will be contacting you directly if there's any issues or questions that need to be addressed. You're required to submit quarterly progress reports under the BJA Performance Metrics Tools PMT system. This is to be submitted in PMT only, and we've provided the reporting dates and website here. Semi-annual progress reports are due in GMS on January 30th and July 30th. This means that you will need to download the semi-annual report in the PMT system and upload it into the GMS system. Unfortunately, the two systems are not linked. Please note that GMS automatically freezes funds for any delinquent reports, so it's important that you submit these reports on time. You're also required to submit federal financial status reports SF 425 under the GMS system. We have provided reporting dates and the website here. And because there's no activities at this time, you'll need to submit the reports as zeros. The award period began October 1st, so report one will be due January 30th. So you can see here October 1st through December 31st is due January 30th. And again, note that GMS automatically freezes funds for any delinquent reports, so it's important to submit these reports on time as well. As part of the special conditions, grantees are required to complete the grants management training. This is required for the point of contact and the financial point of contact listed in GMS. Please make sure the contact information in GMS are correct. You can complete the training in one of two ways. You can complete it through the 24 module training online, or you can complete it in person at our location here in Washington, DC. This in-person training gets filled very quickly, so please make sure to register as early as possible once you receive the notification when it becomes available. You are allowed to use grant funds for this training, and recertification is every three years. Grant adjustment notifications or GANs are used to request for any project changes or corrections. This is to be submitted in our grants management system for review and approval. And here are just a few examples, such as the budget modification, scope changes, project period changes, contacts, uh, change of contact information, program office approval, to name a few. And GANs will not be approved if BJA reporting requirements are delinquent. And here are just uh, additional links that you can refer to. If you have any specific questions pertaining to your grant award, please feel free to contact me directly and I'll be happy to assist you. And this pretty much concludes my portion of the presentation and I'll hand it over to Olivia. Thank you, um, Rachel and Jennifer, for providing that overview. And again, if you have any questions about what was just said, please enter them in the chat box and the icon below, and we'll do our best to answer them at the end of this webinar. Now we will go into the overview of the planning and implementation phase. 
So phase one of this grant is a planning phase in which each grantee is required to complete a planning and implementation guide or PNI guide and a solicitation is referred to the, as the action plan. The NRC has prepared the PNI guide to support grantees in the implementation of proposed initiatives and to help you track progress and make adjustments to maximize positive outcomes. The guide is not intended to serve as a step-by-step -step blueprint but rather to cultivate discussion on best practices, identify considerations for your collaborative efforts, and help you work through key decisions and implementation challenges. Although the guide was developed as a tool for grantee, it also serves as an important tool for your TA provider to understand the status and progress of your project, the type of challenges you are encountering, and the ways your TA provider might be helpful to you in making your project successful. There are seven sections in, of the guide that, will be comp that you will complete and be reviewed closely by your TA provider. A completed P&I guide will include the three de deliverables required to successfully move into phase two implementation. And as m mentioned previously, BJA will be providing final approval of your P&I guide. Now let's talk about the three deliverables during the planning phase. In Section 2 of the P&I Guide, you will begin to address Deliverable 1, Task Force Documentation. Your existing and emerging task force will be responsible for assessing your jurisdiction's capacity through policy and practices to perform the following, data-driven decision-making, staff all allocations to maximize impact, quality and capacity of community providers to address client needs and other barriers to successful reentry, such as housing. Section three of the guide will assist you with understanding your current jurisdiction capacity in the four areas I just mentioned. Action plan part one is deliverable two, an assessment of your jurisdiction reentry system. An assessment of your reentry system will include a research partner. You are required to engage a third party evaluator and a research practitioner partnership throughout the award period. During the planning period, you must establish a baseline recidivism rate and identify a target population for the demonstration project. With the assistance of your research partner, your project must demonstrate the ability to routinely review, process, and outcome data, tweak implementation accordingly, and complete the evaluation. Moving on to the final deliverable, deliverable three, part two of the action plan. This includes a description of the problem and the data that led to its identification as identified through the system assessment in the planning phase. The logic model, a brief description of the solutions to be tested, the general system improvements and strategies in the demonstration project, which we will go into more detail in the next slide, intended outcomes and evaluation metrics, case flow assessment confirming demonstration project will serve 150 offenders and including the research base for proposed strategies. This should include an, evalu an evaluation plan with ongoing analysis, monitoring, and assessment of the overall project impact. General system improvement should benefit all people re entering the community and should incorporate innovative evidence-based practices shown to reduce recidivism. There are six fundamental strategies that are widely accepted as effective in reducing recidivism. Objectively assessing criminogenic risk and needs, enhance intrinsic motivation, target medium to high risk individuals, address individuals' greatest criminogenic needs, use cognitive behavior interventions, and determine dose dosage and intensity of services. Applicants are required to clearly describe how some or all of these evidence-based strategies are integrated into their program design in both pre- and post-release settings. Section three of the PNI guide will assist your jurisdiction in to develop a plan that will implement improvements through policy and practice changes, including developing and revising standard operation procedures, aligning hiring, training and performance standards, and updating partnership and service provider agreements. 
you will be assessing data, pre-release planning, staff capacity, behavioral health, and community supervision. Section 5 of the PNI Guide is a flowchart detailing the screening, assessment, case planning, and programming processes of your reentry system. This exercise asks you to indicate which tools are currently being used by your team and allows you to find where there are screening and assessment gaps in your system. This will also help you plan for the implementation of screening, assessment, case planning, and programming. Your flowchart should also should outline the screening, assessment, case planning, and program processes from initial intake through the discharge of post-release services, as demonstrated in this slide. The flowchart should detail criminogenic risk and needs and behavioral health need assessment, demonstrates who conducts the case planning assessments, show who facilitates the programming, and describes when and where each action occurs. Section 6 is completion of, the lo of a logic model. Some of you may have already completed a similar activity with your team when you were preparing for the proposal you submitted. A logic model demonstrates the casual relationship between goals, activities, and results. It is a useful tool to visualize the purpose and scope of proposed activities, including the resources needed to and expected outcomes. For example, as you decide upon your larger goal for your initiative, you have you thought about what resources you will need to complete the activity and accomplish the objectives and goals? How long will each activity take to complete? Who will be responsible? What will be measured? These are great discussions to have with your research partner. Developing a well thought out logic model will help ensure achievement of your goals. The sample provided walks through two goals. The first is to implement risk and needs assessment the resource needed to do this will include grant funding and additional training funds for correctional staff. By July 2020, they will integrate the tool for use during the intake process and during reentry case planning. The process measure for this goal will be the number of assessments completed. The outcome will be that 100% of case plans will be developed based on prioritizing domains identified through risk needs assessment. This data collection chart found in Section 7 of your PNI Guide is to assist you in assessing and documenting the process and outcomes of your program, recidivism, and violent crime reduction strategies. Work closely with your research partner when completing this chart. Be sure to refer back to the outputs and outcomes that were identified in the logic model. Once your PNI guide or action plan, as it is referred to in the solicitation, is approved by the Bureau of Justice Systems, you will move into phase two, implementation, and gain access to the remainder of your grant funds. With ongoing technical assistance from your TA provider and your PNI guide as your reference, you will begin to implement the general system improvements and demonstration project to test strategies for addressing gaps and deficits that were identified as it relates to your jurisdiction's reentry system and targeted population. During this time, you should also be actively working with your research partner to make necessary adjustments along the way. At 30 months, you will be required to submit a preliminary process evaluation reflecting both the general system improvements and demonstration project. Please note this process evaluation should not include an assessment of the planning phase. This slide provides examples of general system improvement. Again, as mentioned previously, the primary goal for general system improvement is to benefit all offenders and reentry. These improvements can be done in the form of formalizing policy change, improving information sharing improvements, updating risk assessment protocols, or improving fidelity practices. Your jurisdiction system improvements may focus on staff training, training on ethics, motivation interviewing, or case planning. Your strategy for general system improvement should answer the following question. How is your jurisdiction align aligning hiring, training, and performance measures with best practices? Your demonstration project should aim to reduce recidivism among a targeted population, specific age, group, gender, or race, 
identified through data analysis as having a relatively high recidivism rate, returning to a particular jurisdiction area where a disproportionate population of offenders will be released from prison or jail or who are housed in the same facility prior to release. A few examples of demonstration projects to be implemented with this grant are the New Jersey Department of Corrections will pilot a housing unit for incarcerated veterans. The City of Indianapolis will support the Overcoming Literacy and Employment Barriers in Marion County program for participants ranging from 18 to 24 years old. And St. Croix Chippewa Indians of Wisconsin will support the St. Croix Tribal Offender Reintegration Program through Culture and Community Corrections. Finally, phase three evaluation, the final 12 months of the grant period. During this phase, you are to track recidivism and other outcomes defined in the evaluation to assess effectiveness of the interventions and strategies. Recidivism measures must include arrest, conviction, and incarceration. Please refer back to Appendix C of the solicitation for a full list of additional recidivism measures. Due at 36 months is the preliminary outcome and or impact evaluation report, and the final process and outcome evaluation is due at grant closeout, 90 days after the end of the grant period, or 51 months. This concludes the planning and implementation process of the grant. We will now hear from Robert Behawk, Program Manager of the Office of Reentry, Louisiana Department of Public Safety and Corrections. Robert? Thank you very much, Olivia, and uh, thank you all all for participating. Um, I, I was asked to come in and talk uh, to you all as a uh, 2017 uh, awardee about my experiences and my state's experiences through the Innovations and Reentry Initiative. Um, our original application uh, had three main goals, the examining the outcomes of the Louisiana Prisoner Reentry Initiative, and what the Louisiana Prisoner Reentry Initiative is, uh, is our version of the transition from prison, prison to the community model. Um, Louisiana historically has not been the most, um, I, I, I must say not on the front of the curve when it comes to reentry or uh, providing services. Uh, we've been very traditional in the, we're gonna put people in jail and that's about as far as the thought process went. So in looking at how we can do things better and how we can push that culture change, that, that um, departmental change, uh, we, we framed that up in, in something called the Louisiana Prisoner Reentry Initiative. So uh, utilizing this grant is a way to uh, judge the effectiveness of that. Um, also implementing assess, assessment informed interventions. Um, the more that we understand about our population, the better we can treat them, and then the better we can judge the impact of how we treated them. Uh, and then promoting culture change among staff. Uh, in, you know, in, in my description of Louisiana corrections up to that point, uh, it, it would not be hard to, to come to the conclusion that we were not the most reentry focused people and uh, much more law enforcement uh, on the community supervision and the uh, incarcerated uh, staff, incarceration staff as well. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so in, in, in looking at, you know, that's, that was the, 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 the where we started um, to where we are now, and we still have some time left. Um, we have taken our uh, risk needs responsivity tool. Um, it's called Tiger because, of course, we're from Louisiana. Why wouldn't we call it that? And um, we have not only taken the initial models but built additional models out of it. So we have gender-specific models, one for uh, our elderly population, um, and, and then one specifically for supervision and uh, institutional. Um, we've begun making inf uh, programmatic and uh, facility decisions based off of that. Um, we've started down the road where we can show more of the where we're going with the intervention. So, you know, we, we have, we're going through justice reinvestment right now. So there's a, a, a pool of funding that's available that is, is finite. So when the funding goes away, how will we best be able to tell what, where we get our most bang for our buck or where we should continue to be funding or, or, or trying to find funding to continue. Um, and then we've also, uh, 
through part of the, the prisoner reentry initiative, there's a call for the, the, the warm handoff from institutional to the community. And uh, in doing such, we decided to partially fund 10 positions across the state. We, we call them community coordinators, but the thought was that we could give a small amount of money to uh, several nonprofits around the state and partially fund these positions. Um, what we hoped what would happen and did end up happening is those nonprofits came up with their own match funding to be able to have a full-time position uh, all across the state. That is, um, th their primary goal is to coordinate the reentry efforts of those communities that they're responsible to. And then I skipped over the first bullet because I uh, kind of wanted to cover those other two first, but we also developed a homelessness assessment. And I, I develop is not kind of a misnomer because council state governments was very kind to have one already that we could just modify slightly um, because that's a, a, one of the most major destabilizers there is from a reentry perspective. And that's one of the things that from a correction staff like myself, you know, if they're in jail, we don't have to worry about their housing. They're, they're in jail. Um, but on, for those on supervision, that's a very important thing. So we've also developed the, the, the modified uh, assessment and we are going to integrate that into TIGER. We're piloting a very, very interesting project around that right now. Um, when we're talking about lessons learned, and I could honestly spend about two hours talking about this, but um, I, I think the primary thing is, is, is trust, trust your technical assistance. Um, they're, they're there to help you. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to understand at the beginning that it's okay to not know things. Um, it, it's, it's okay to, know, to not know that this is the way you're supposed to do things. And, um, you know, so, so really engaging with them, taking the time to explain things to them and have them explain things to you. Um, you know, I, I, in grad school, the, I had a teacher that one of my first classes said, know what you don't know. Very important thing. Um, and the great thing about having the NRRC there is that there is more than likely someone who has gone through that problem and has come up with a solution or has come up with another way for it to not work, which is sometimes equally as, uh, as, as important. Um, you know, when, as you get further into implementation, uh, be prepared for things to go wrong. Um, we've had to go on through, and, and I'll cover some more on the next slide, but we've gone through uh, in, in Louisiana several uh, fairly, like fairly large changes in our grant based off of political pressures and, um, you know, leadership not wanting to wait for budget authorization and go ahead and like, well, we're just going to do it now. Well, you can't really, but okay and um, kind of figuring that out as you go. Uh, another thing that was mentioned earlier and, and I kind of wanted to touch on is the, the, the idea of evaluation. Um, it's very, very important to engage with your evaluation partner as soon and as frequent as possible. Um, it's very difficult to go backwards in trying to put together evaluation methodologies and data collection matrix um, and things like that. So the earlier you have them, uh, at least knowledgeable in what you're wanting to do, uh, the better. Um, yeah, switch to the next slide, or my next slide, not y'all's. Um, so when we're talking about the benefits of technical assistance, it's TA is great. I mean, I, I mean, they, they didn't pay me to say that, I promise. Um, the, the TA has helped us as Louisiana navigate through all of the changes and all of the, you know, this, you wake up the next day and like, something drastic has changed. A new governor has come in, new legislators that are pushing new laws. Um, help, they helped us completely rework our evaluation methodology when we had um, some, some people at, say, higher up in government decided that randomization was not the way to go. How do we completely restructure things and move forward. Um, you know, TA helped us understand some things. Like there, there's some, you know, we, we say these, bu these buzzwords like quality assurance, fidelity, evidence-based practice, research informed, promising practice, uh, implementation leadership. These are all things that if done right have wonderful impact, but you have to understand what they are to be able to get to that impact. Um, and and I, I talk really fast, y'all, and I'm just I'm trying to save time for questions and answers. So um, if anyone has any questions for me, uh, either during the session or you think about something afterwards, by all means, um, reach out to me. Uh, but that concludes my slides. So thank you very much for your time.
Thank you so much for that, Robert. And um, now we will go into our question and answer session. So again, if you guys have any questions, um, please put them in the chat box below, um, and then we'll be do our best to answer them all um, as they come in. And actually, our first question is for you, Robert. Um, could you describe what the planning and implementation uh -oh. guide process was like for your team and how we can best work through that? Uh, planning and implementation guide, um, the first, you know, and, and I've been fortunate to have gone through a couple since then. Um, the, it's, it's, it's tedious, it's painstaking, but it is essential. Um, you know, the, the, I, I, I use the analogy when I was grading some applications for something else the other day. It, it's, you know, your, your application basically says, you know, I want to go from Baton Rouge to Houston. But as you get through your planning and implementation guide, it is the exact route you took, the stops that you made, the amount of gas that you bought, the snacks that you did, all of those things that getting into those hyper specifics. Those hyper specifics are incredibly important to know when things are happening the way they're supposed to and when they're not and how to, how to adjust from there. Um, so while it is sometimes a tedious and, and difficult process, it is absolutely essential to your program. Great, thank you, Robert. And you're popular today. We have another one for you. All right, so um, I don't even have to unmute. <laughs> how did they? How did you all put your reentry task force together? What was the structure and frequency oh. of the meetings? Anything you can provide in regards to? Oh, thank you. To yeah, I, I, I did forget to cover that. Uh, we're fortunate that we have a governor that was, um, this is, and is still aligned with us. So. Um, we had some legislation passed that uh, created our reentry advisory council. And um, this is more of an executive steering team. This is the, 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 the people that can affect policy and affect larger change. Um, and it, it consists of a couple of legislators, the secretaries from Corrections, Workforce Commission, our Career and Technical College System, Department of Health, um, and a couple of returned citizens and um, some, some random Joes like myself. Uh, they, they, when we're speaking about the meetings, we meet at least quarterly. Um, and we've started to begin to branch out some specific subcommittees um, based on the, the needs of our, as we move through our reentry efforts. Uh, we just started an employer advisory committee. Um, and and, and that's, 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 I guess that answers that question then. Great, thank you. All right, we have another question that came in. Looks like this one's for you as well, Robert. Um, oh, at what then? point? <laughs> at what point in your grant project did you determine it was necessary to submit a grant adjustment notice, and why? Okay, that's actually a pretty easy one. When when I spoke of the uh, the leadership not wanting to wait for budget authorization. Um, initial, our initial project, so if I'm going to say this was probably about a month after we got out of planning, um, we were originally going to fund five positions uh, in our probation and parole uh, office to um, be the, the contact for reentry efforts for that, that you are not an agent, you are something else, you, you have different responsibilities. Um, well, our secretary didn't want to wait for that. Um, didn't want to wait for the budget authorization, so he went ahead and hired them, which means we could not through these funds. And that's where the community coordinators came from. Um, we pivoted with that funding, put in the request, talked it through with uh, the NRRC, um, with our technical assistance in BJA, and got through that. Um, so to answer your question, almost immediately we did a GAN. Because, um, I mean, that, they, these, these are moving, living, breathing contracts and programs. Great. Thank you. Um, we have another question, and Rachel, I will direct this one to you. Are we currently in the 12-month planning phase of the timeline that was shown, even though our budgets haven't been approved? Oh, gosh. Um, there's an official answer and an unofficial answer. The official answer is yes, you are in the 12-month period. The unofficial answer has a but, which is 
um, no one is going to hold it against you that time period that it takes to get your budget clearance. Um, so we don't expect you until your budget is cleared to be doing any substantial work on this project um, or any work really at all or encumbering any of the funds. So uh, if your budget clearance takes three months, no one's going to count that against you. Great. Thank you for that, Rachel. It looks like we have a few more minutes if anybody has any other questions. Um, we have one here. Uh, Jennifer, I will direct this question to you. Um, what would you consider approved costs that can be spent during the planning phase? So that's anything in relation to completing the planning and implementation guide. So sometimes it can include personnel, maybe some supplies, or coordination, travel, or training. But if you have any questions, feel free to contact me directly and I can answer your question. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Robert, we have a question that came in for you. Can you explain the, explain the landscape process? How was it executed? The landscape process? I'm hearing that right. Was the landscape process? Yes, that was the question. What is the landscape process? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm missing the, the what? Um, for the person who asked that, then if you could kind of explain um, what you're referring to when you say the landscape process. What did I say? Did I say landscape process? Someone could help me because I honestly don't remember saying it. Something referring to landscape scan, scanning process maybe. I am not sure if that person could please clarify. We uh, we circle back around to it. I'd, I'd be glad to answer uh, if I understand. Um, I think relating to Phase one goal of the PNI guide. Let me refer. I mean, I believe this question might be referring to a specific question um, in the PNI guide. Oh, um, so I'm not sure if Robert okay. will be able to answer that. Well, I mean, I can pull yeah. up mine and look for that. So hold on. We're looking for landscape. <clears throat> um, Robert, that's fine. We'll um, reach back out to this individual and answer them Absolutely. Um, directly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, if there are no other questions, um, our contact information will be provided. And as mentioned earlier, these, um, this webinar has been recorded and we will be providing the slide decks as well for your reference at any time. Um, again, feel free to reach out if you have any specific questions at any time. So we want to thank you guys for joining us today um, for today's webinar. <laughs>